Thanks everyone for showing up, uh, enjoying the sunny Princeton. Um, I'm going to report on some couple, couple of joint works with uh, mainly with Hao and a couple of uh, PhD students who are all at Tsinghua uh, on a project uh, about uh, crossing events in critical lattice models. I'm going to focus on the random cluster models. So that's the title over there. And you can reach me in either of these email addresses in either of these universities. So this is the Helsinki University of Technology, which has changed its name. And I'm also still partially in the University of Bonn. Also, if anyone has uh, graduating students or finishing postdocs, I'm offering postdoc positions in the Helsinki University of Technology. So feel free to advertise. Uh, OK, so let's get started. I can see this myself. So this is the plan. So I need to define the models for you if you haven't seen them before. So I'm going to focus on planar uh, critical models and they're going for invariance in this talk. Uh, and I'm going to be looking at uh, crossing events from boundary to boundary. And this is imposed by plugging some boundary conditions, which uh, then uh, constrain the model to have some kind of crossings in various ways. And of particular interest are scaling limits of these models and relation to CFT. So hopefully I have time in the end to say some uh, heuristic nonsense about boundary CFT, how these are related to that. And so the rigorous main result of today, I guess, is for the FK easing model, which is the Q equals two random cluster model. One can also prove similar results for percolation, but in a slightly different setup on the side percolation on a triangular lattice, because we need convergence of uh, interfaces. And perhaps you know that uh, for that, one needs some kind of techniques, for instance, um, finding a holomorphic observable, which is not available for all situations. So for general models, uh, for the general critical range. Maybe I could include from zero to four, actually, the cluster weight. Uh, these formulas are conjectural, so I have no reason to doubt that they wouldn't hold. Uh, okay, so there are results also from spin easing model, which I will not uh, discuss, and I will mention this uh, UST case as well. And uh, yeah, so let's get started. Feel free to interrupt anytime. Uh, I'm gonna be on the high level. So just a roadmap if you're not working in this area. So I'm kind of coming from planar uh, statistical physics, planar conformal field theory, uh, SLE, CLE point of view. So I'm going to be interested in uh, critical models on lattices in the plane or maybe on surfaces, but in my case, just Euclidean um, plane. And there is this uh, conjecture that a few people in the audience also are very familiar with or even were involved in uh, stating these predictions is that critical various observa observables in critical lattice models should converge to quantities in a quantum field theory which has conform invariance so that is a conform field theory and this is something uh, we mathematicians have been trying to understand for quite a while and prove rigorously uh, you can look at some geometric uh, events in these critical lattice models, for instance, the crossings. And these can be encoded in interfaces, which are described by conformal invariant random curves, schramm learner evolutions, SLE, uh, in the scaling limit. So that's one way to make a rigorous sense of conformal invariance of um, geometric quantities in these kind of models. And then maybe a punchline of my talk is that there's some kind of correspondence between certain observables for SLE and uh, correlation functions in CFT. So at least you can observe that things that appear in the physics literature, you know, match with these uh, rigorously proven scale limit results. So that's somehow the triangle of interest of the talk. Uh, okay, so let me start by introducing the model uh, for today. So I'm going to be interested in a, a planar domain with some uh, grid. 
and uh, randomly added a cheese there. So here are a couple of configurations taken from Geoffrey Grimmett's book. And uh, let's say their bonds have state zero or one. So either they are present or they are not present. And uh, we put some property distribution there. And the simplest one is the Bernoulli population where everyone is independent. You flip some coin, maybe a P biased coin uh, for each edge and you decide if you keep it or not. But uh, of course, that's uh, quite a simple model. So you could add interaction. And how you do it with these cluster models is that you add an additional parameter, which I call Q, and you weight each cluster formed by the, these bonds by the parameter Q. So a cluster is a connected component of these bonds, right? And let's say the parameter is positive. And um, example cases are related to uh, also the spin easing and pulse models, uh, also uniform spanning trees, electrical networks. So the main motivation, I guess, by Fortu Castellane and others in the beginning of this story was to try to cook up some family of models that encompasses many uh, examples that we are interested in and try to prove or derive uh, more kind of general results for this uh, family. And then you can specialize to uh, various values of these parameters uh, if you're interested in a certain model, okay? And uh, let's see, so here are a couple of other uh, facts. I already mentioned this relation to easing model. So you can couple these, uh, these clusters with easing spin clusters in a certain way. The temperature in the spin easing model will be related to this parameter P, which was telling me if uh, an edge was the probability of an edge to be present or absent. And the cluster weight happens to be two in that case. Uh, okay. Then since I'm interested in critical models, I should tell you that I will uh, specialize these parameters to have this relation. So let's say we are in, in Z2, so it depends on the choice of lattice, but I'm going to be working on Z2 for now. So there's a critical value of P, which has this formula in terms of the Q, uh, such that the model has a continuous phase transition in, in this, uh, at this point P. When it's proven rigorously, when the Q is on this range, so that's what I'm focusing on, uh, it's believed to hold for this range of Qs, while when Q is larger than four, the phase transition is proven to be discontinuous. So we will not discuss this case. And so what is the phase transition? So here is a couple of pictures. You see this one is a bit more sparse and this one is quite more <coughs> dense. So these are samples of, I think, uh, just percolation. But you can see that varying the parameter P, it's a bit small. So on the left-hand side, P is uh, 0.3. On the right hand side, P is 0.7. Um, if you vary from there to there, actually at when P is one half, that's the critical P for broccolation, uh, something happens. Namely, if you look at this model on the square, you take a Z2 lattice, but you take a mesh size of the lattice, some delta going to zero. So you take a scaling limit. <laughs> Uh, you could ask whether there's a crossing of these bonds from left to right. And you see that on the right picture is very likely, right? So it's gonna be always the case in the limit. While in the left picture, it's almost always not the case. So the probability of a left to right crossing by these bonds, depending on this parameter P, will be zero when P is small in the limit, scaling limit will be one when the P is large and something happens at, in the, this critical P. And at this point, the probability of crossing is a non-trivial uh, number that one might want to calculate. So that's what I'm gonna focus on in, in this talk. Okay, um, hope it's uh, clear so far. If you want to phrase the phase transition differently, you can ask about infinite clusters, but let me not go there. Uh, okay, so now let's specify a bit more. So this picture is supposed to have the bond still on this uh, black. 
So here's a sample of a random cluster model. Now I pick my Q in this range. Uh, sorry, it's here. On this uh, critical range that we know has a continuous phase transition, and I will fix the P to be this special value. So you can do a computation that the probability weight of a configuration. So it was uh, uh, you flip the P coin to say if the bond is open or closed, but then you also weight by this cluster weight. So you can do a computation to write this uh, probability of a configuration in terms of loops. So what are loops? If you look at the picture, so there are these uh, black bonds, which are maybe not super visible, but then I hope you see loops surrounding these uh, bonds. So you can uh, draw loops around clusters of bonds in the random cluster model, and you could then count the number of loops. And it turns out that if there's nothing happening on the boundary, so forget about this M, uh, the probability configuration is actually proportional to Q to the number of loops uh, over two uh, at this critical point. So it's a computation, it's not hard. But I want to do something more interesting. So I want to impose some behavior in the model by adding some boundary condition and if you look at the picture, there's a lot of text. So I'm saying here's some wired boundary arc, free boundary arc, and so on. And if you look closely, the wired boundary arc has like bonds in all of these edges, while the free one has a dashed line. So it means in the dual model is wired. And in the primal model, there are no bonds in this free arc. I could do alternating arcs in this way. So here also wired and they're wired and the other one's free. <coughs> and if you then sample your configuration and you draw the loops, you will see this colored kind of path. So there's a blue one, red one and yellow one, uh, which are not loops, but paths between the boundary points where I'm changing from free to wired. So I have to take into account also the weights from these paths. And that is this uh, factor M over here. And it will depend on how you impose the boundary condition. And the probability of a crossing event is then the question, uh, what is the random connection of these uh, paths inside the configuration? So I'm going to call the random configuration of the paths uh, by this bar theta. And I'm going to forget about the other loops because they are, you know, they might be microscopic. So if you take the scaling limit, for sure, at least these big microscopic caudal loop paths, they will survive. So that's something I can study nicely. Uh, okay, so what I need to do, I need to tell you what is this M, right? And if you uh, do a computation of the monocle, so that was the original one, uh, I claim that you get to the probability weight just being Q to the number of loops over two at this critical value. Uh, if you take into account the uh, boundary condition, you encounter so-called meander matrix. So here is a bit more illustrative example. So here is the formula. So it's also Q to the number of loops over two, but of what? So of, of these uh, uh, caudal paths that are inside. So they are not loops because they are ending on the boundary but I could complement them outside to become some kind of loops. So maybe if you look at this picture, above here is supposed to be an inside connection and under here is supposed to be some boundary condition. Uh, it was easier to draw on this. So I'm pretending the upper half plane is my domain and the lower half plane is outside. But when drawing these things, the bounded domain is easier. So in a bounded domain, if I have these six mark points, I can actually put uh, five different boundary conditions. So they are in these pictures. And so what does it mean? So this blue, uh, every other arc, they are still wired like in the previous picture. But I could also decide that maybe these two uh, and also this one, they are wired also together outside. And that is affecting the cluster weight of the model because now all the clusters that are attached to these wired arcs they will belong to the same cluster if I decide that they are connected outside. So in the end of the day, if you think about it, you just have to add this kind of factor 
to your uh, measure for this different boundary condition, where you count the number of loops formed by the internal connection, which is this alpha, and the external connection, that is the boundary condition, which I call beta. I hope it's uh, reasonably clear. So maybe if you look at one example, because the picture is not super uh, nice. So I draw the green dot as a marked point just to transfer to the upper half plane because it's easier to see there. Then if I go counterclockwise, I have these marked points there. <laughs> and now I could follow the boundary of this kind of outside cluster that I'm imposing. And I see that I get the pairing of the points. So from the green one, if I follow the boundary, I will get all the way to the other side, which is now that point over there. And then the inside boundary of, of, of this outside cluster here will be a kind of next door connection and the same there. So there's a way of transforming these external wirings into planar pairing diagrams. And that's what I use to label this beta, uh, which is uh, the boundary condition. And analogously, I can inside then, maybe if I go back to the other picture, if you look at the inside configuration, so these three parts, the blue one is going from this point all the cross there. So it's pairing two of these mark points. Uh, the yellow one is pairing these next door points and the red one these ones. So I can label the inside connections also by planar pairings. So hence, if I map everything to the upper half plane, I get pictures like this and I can count the loops uh, formed by the random inside configuration with the fixed outside configuration. And that's the effect of the boundary condition. Okay. I also understand the connectivity in the bottom left when there is no outside connectivity. What is the boundary of free and wide? Uh, this one? Yeah. So these are kind of independently wired. So this is wired, but it's no, not wired with the other ones. So if you follow somehow the boundary of this cluster outside, it's just this one. Uh, so this is the green point. Why, why can't they follow it all the way to the next one? Uh, because this is uh, dual wire. <coughs> There's an obstruction. It kind of extends to okay. uh, uh, yeah, kind of, the Oh, I see. So when you don't draw the connection of the prior. Yeah, the so wire, this is like meaning that they are not connected. Right. Somehow that the dual one, so I should maybe draw in the dual. This one will be connected in the dual. Okay. Over right. there and also over there. But I wasn't drawing the duals here because it yeah. becomes too messy. Right. Right. So there's this duality uh, going on. Uh, any more questions? Is the setup somehow clear enough? There's just combinatorial notation, uh, alphas and betas for this inside and outside uh, connection. Uh, and I'm interested in probabilities of what's happening inside with these different boundary conditions. And that's going to be related to also conformal blocks in CFT if I get there. But first, the main result will be uh, scaling image result on these crossing probabilities. Uh, okay, so maybe notation is not super much used, I think. It's var theta was the random connection inside. It can take some number of possible values. So I could ask, what is the probability that the var theta is some given alpha? And um, alpha is indexed by these planar pairings. I call them LP, like link patterns. It's just a finite set. Of indices. Okay, uh, very good. So now let me just quickly motivate because I was describing some very particular model. I already mentioned these critical models a little bit. I think it's very familiar to probably almost everyone. So in the plane, what do we expect? So if we have a model of a continuous phase transition uh, at the critical point, we observe this kind of uh, scale invariance. So this is a simulation of a spin easing model as it's a bit easier to see than the other ones. So you see there's some uh, fractal nature of these interfaces. And if you kind of zoom in or out, uh, it looks similar. So it's a self-similar type uh, picture. And the prediction is that if you take this guy on a delta times delta grid and you take delta to zero, it's described by some confound field theory uh, in some sense. And uh, 
rigorous results include, maybe I'm missing something, but uh, some features, for instance, confirm invariance of these cluster boundaries and of certain crossing events, including a subset of my talk, uh, are only being proven for some specific models because of the mathematical tools being somehow using some very refined integrability properties of the models or uh, somehow some kind of tricks which don't seem to generalize for a wide range of models. So for instance, the Bernoulli site percolation was Smirnov's uh, proof 20 years ago or a bit more, uh, still only works on the triangular lattice. Then I mentioned spin easing model that I'm not going to talk about in this talk, but you can prove similar results. The FK easing model is the main topic of the talk. Then you can look at some uh, free boson, Gaussian free field, dimer uh, problems. You can look at spanning trees that I will also mention. And for the model of random cluster model, that's for today. Let me mention that there's some nice work by Ugodominil, Kokan, and others showing that in the scaling limit, you actually get rotation invariance of the model, but uh, to somehow enhance it to a scale invariance, because what is conform invariance? It's kind of infinitesimal translation, uh, scaling, and rotation invariance. So the scaling invariance is the difficult bit, and uh, they, to my knowledge, haven't, they, are, they are working on it, but they haven't progressed very much yet. So hopefully we will see some results later. <laughs> But if you focus on not the model as a measure, so on the whole model, but just some questions like these cluster boundaries or crossing probabilities, uh, you can try to show at least the conforming variance of those things first. And from this conform uh, field theory prediction of PBC and others, you can even uh, get some formulas that should describe these uh, quantum Entities. And that's what I want to communicate. So I want to give you some rigorous results and some conjectures that are actually uh, think made by Peter or already John Cardi and others earlier that uh, one could try to prove if one gets the techniques. Okay. And in the planar case, everything is somehow quite uh, nice in a sense that you can write down some formulas and you can use complex analysis techniques also. So I just got back to the uh, triangle. So this is the big question. How do critical lattice models converge to CFT? Uh, one way to try and understand it are these uh, interfaces on the lattice level and their scaling limits. So to describe these probabilities of crossings, it's useful to describe first these uh, interfaces, which are boundaries between the clusters. So let me quickly remind you, if you haven't seen uh, or if you've forgotten, uh, what these interfaces uh, converge to. So the picture is again a spin easing model, but never mind. So here I put the spin easing model with minus spins on one side and plus spins on the other side, so the Dobushin boundary condition. And then I will always have a microscopic interface between the two corners. And one can prove that this interface converges to some uh, random curve in the plane, termed SLE, kappa, with a certain kappa. Um, and so why does this proof not work for all models? The trouble is that if you try, try and make this convergence rigorous, so first of all, a random curve, it's a probability measure on some uh, set of curves. So you need some kind of convergence of measures in order to state this kind of result. So first you want to show some pre-compactness or tightness so that at least some sub subsequences converge. But then you also need to show that all the subsequences converge to the same thing. So you somehow have to, have to identify the limit. So there are kind of two, two steps usually in the philosophy. And there are quite uh, general techniques for the tightness. So for example, this uh, random cluster model that I'm talking about, uh, uh, this tightness is known. So there are good crossing estimates for that. Um, while this identification step is the one that's using some trick. And this trick doesn't seem to generalize to the whole family of models, unfortunately. So uh, that's the piece that would need some new input to make the conjecture rigorous. But the trick does work for the FK easing model. So that's what we can use. Uh, okay, so just uh, to say that this object, we can understand it. 
So what is this uh, random curve in the plane between two corners of the rectangle? So I, I was claiming it's conformal invariant, which means that if I map the rectangle to some other simply connected domain, I map the two boundary points to some boundary points. So let's say I mapped it in the upper half plane and one boundary point was zero and the other one is at infinity. Uh, I could describe the law of the curve uh, over here and then I can push back uh, there. So it's sufficient to understand it in one reference domain in this caudal case. And this you can do by uh, Lerner's uh, theory. So briefly, so let's pretend it's a simple curve. It's not always the case, but in the picture it, it is. So let's say you parameterize it in some way and you want to understand for each time where is the curve going. So you can freeze the curve up to time t. So you have this kind of slit domain. You can conformally map it back by some uh, conform map depending on the time uh, with a chosen normalization. And then what happens is that the kind of curve gets uh, you know, unwinded and then the tip goes somewhere in the boundary and you know, the future growth will be growing over here. And uh, for these SLE curves, you can describe the growth actually by standard run emotion with some speed. Uh, and the speed is uh, determined by this uh, Kappa parameter. And then of course you can go backwards to you know, generate the whole curve. So basically it's a random curve, quite universal, just built from Brown emotion using conform maps. So we understand it pretty well. Uh, since I'm gonna talk about crossing properties, I need to tell about multiple curves and don't be scared of the formulas. This is just to say that everything is quite concrete. So let's say we have these other marked points. So in the model, they will be points where the boundary condition is changing from wire to free. So of course, if I draw an interface, which is a boundary of a cluster, it will feel the boundary condition. So somehow these other points, if I'm exploring from one point, they will affect my, uh, my growth process in such a way that instead of just brown emotion for the image of the tip, there will be a drift. And the drifting is encoded into some smooth function that's usually called the Z, it's called the partition function. And this, this will be featuring in the main result. So it's some function of several variables. So each variable is the time evolution of a mark point. And uh, it's giving somehow the interaction from the boundary condition or whatever you want to this one curve that you're growing. And this other equation is just the usual equation describing the time evolution of the marked points. So never mind that. Uh, we don't gonna need it. And then of course you start from some initial uh, configuration. So here's a stochastic differential equation of the time evolutions of the marked points. One of which is the image of the tip of the curve I'm growing while exploring. So I can say that at least up to some time, if this function is nice, you, you have a solution. But then I have to describe what this function is. So this is the interaction part, right? And uh, something that's known, I think I will not go there. It's familiar to many of you. If not, it's okay. We don't need it here. So I'm claiming that in my setup, because everything is very uh, symmetric, somehow each point represents a starting point of a cluster boundary. There's some kind of symmetry that imposes that this function Z is the solution to a second order differential equation uh, which is uh, called the BBC equation from Belavin polykov zamlochikov because it also appears in conform field theory. So from probabilistic point of view, you will find this if you study your problem, uh, growing one curve, trying to understand what this interaction is doing. So it's a martingale, uh, Gerson-Oak tilting of the usual Brown emotion by the interaction. So it's given by some martingale. And if you compute, uh, the stochastic uh, differential of that martingale, you will find that the drift is proportional to this thing. But if it was a martingale or maybe a local martingale, the drift has to vanish. So that's why you will have this kind of equation. And you can actually do it for any of the mark points because in my uh, model, everything is very symmetric. So I was just focusing here for one point. 
so that's one nice property that we have, because we can try then to classify all possible functions that satisfy this equation. There's another uh, property, which is if you do a Möbius map, so things are usually conforming invariant in this uh, business when you try to describe a conforming invariant models, but sometimes they're not invariant, but covariant, and you just get factors of the uh, derivatives of the conform map here in front if you do a transformation. But this is uh, not super relevant for us. I'm just saying that there's some transformation rule that you also have. In particular, if you have four mark points, uh, this uh, Möbius covariance allows you to fix three of them, and then your problem reduces to just one uh, degree of freedom, which is the cross ratio of the points. So somehow four point cases are easy to analyze for this reason. But if you go to some situation of 100 mark points, then, well, you can remove three of them using this conformal map, but you still have quite a lot left. So you have to do some work then to understand uh, what's going on. Uh, okay, but I claim that we can also understand solutions to this problem pretty well. And some of you have heard about this uh, quite a lot, I think, so I will not go there. I will go back to the model. So uh, let's see. So the upshot was that if you explore an interface, maybe here is easier to see, you can describe it in the scaling limit, at least conjecturally, by this uh, stochastic Leibniz evolution with the brown emotion plus some drift. And the drift is given by the interaction that my imposed boundary condition will generate. Okay. So finally, I'm getting to a main result. So let's say we are looking at some boundary domain with some marked points, and they are converging in a certain sense to a continuum domain and points. And these points are the points where the wired and free segments will change in the pictures. So here's the tiny picture that we had earlier. And I'm fixing something that's happening outside. So I didn't draw it here, but I was calling them beta. So one of these uh, external wirings. And I'm asking what is the uh, probability that these uh, interfaces connecting the marked points uh, connect in a certain way. And I was labeling them by some alpha. So this is the probability of interest. And then I'm interested in the delta go to zero limit. So that's the scaling limit. So I'm looking at my model on the delta times delta square grid. It's probably not written here, but it was, yeah. So this is supposed to be within a delta times delta square grid. And delta goes to zero is converging to some continuum thing. Uh, so the claim is that while well, the limit exists, maybe not super surprising because this uh, number between zero and one, at least there's some subsequential limits, but it's also given by some expression, which looks a bit horrible, but I will try to tell you what the objects are. So it's not that horrible. So it's a ratio of two things, uh, which represent these partition functions for the growing uh, interfaces. So one is called Z and one is called F. And then there's a constant, which is M. So it's an element of a certain matrix. It's called the meander matrix, which is, I, I think, familiar to many of you. Um, so this is uh, counting somehow the loops uh, formed by this external and internal uh, connection. So it's a combinatorial number. And this ratio is the ratio of two interaction terms, kind of. So we call the upstairs uh, pure partition functions, usually, in the SLE theory. And the downstairs is the one that's related to what boundary conditions I put. So that was this beta. I will tell you what they are soon. Okay, uh, so before going there, just uh, maybe a couple of remarks. So you can observe that this guy will be conformally invariant as predicted. So I was in the critical uh, case. Uh, you can observe some CFT predictions. In particular, this formula uh, and the general one that's on the next slide was conjectured, I think, in Peter's, one of Peter's papers. And uh, now I'm reporting that at least we managed to prove it in one case. Uh, I don't know if uh, where this idea originally appeared, but uh, probably already Cardi was studying crossing probabilities of especially four points. He managed to predict the formula for the four point. 
case. And for many points, it was, uh, I think, in this paper of uh, Peter with uh, Stephen Flores, uh, Jake Simmons, and uh, Ziv. There's also a related paper of Kostya Isurov uh, lately. Uh, he was uh, proving a convergence of, uh, in a certain special case of these interfaces uh, that we also wanted to use, but we actually had to do a more general case as well in our paper. So the hope was to use his paper, but we could use uh, most of it. So he has a nicely written convergence of the interfaces. Uh, okay, any questions on the statement? Okay, so then I should explain what these things are. Uh, before that, let me just give you a conjecture. Ah, yeah, good point. So conjecture is that you can do the same for other values of kappa. Uh, so yeah, kappa is related to this cluster weight Q, so I forgot to say uh, in a certain way. So here's the formula. So I stated the conjecture for this known critical range of the cluster weight. Uh, it should also hold for the cluster weights between zero and one, which is believed to be critical. Uh, so I'm restricting to this case also because some pieces of the proof, we assume something like this kappa is bigger than four uh, to analyze some uh, integral formulas. And I should track, you know, if there's some trouble uh, if you move kappa to be smaller. But it's, uh, this is just a technical kind of restriction. Uh, so you should have analogous things, just uh, dependent on this parameter kappa in the general case. And uh, of course, the properties from CFT. So I have a bit of slice in the, towards the end, match with this phi one to um, boundary field that should generate these uh, interfaces from the boundary or in other words, whose correlation functions should somehow impose the boundary condition that I was putting here. So in particular, the differential equations I showed are you know, exactly those ones. Uh, all right. So then this is the theorem stated again. So here's the proof strategy. It's uh, just a kind of standard idea in, in this business. So you first try to understand the interfaces how they are described by these SLE processes. And uh, we could, uh, yeah, Isuro of proved the special case and we could, uh, we actually had to describe, so he had some kind of uh, observable that was needed for the identification of the limit. So we needed to cook up a more general observable for this general case, but this can be carried out. Um, and once you have that, you can analyze this ratio here under the time evolution of the points, if you explore one interface, if you remember this SLE picture, and that will be giving a martingale, and then you can do a martingale argument. And the trouble is that this is potentially ill-behaved, so you have to do a lot of analysis to actually, yeah, get to the option stopping theorem. So somehow the main point here is that you have to control uh, things. Uh, something else that's not obvious from when I will show you the formulas, is that this thing, this martingale, is actually positive and it's something that you need. So that's also a technical point one has to mind here. And uh, it's a headache for when you have these formulas and you cannot verify whether they are even real valued or mm -hmm. you can verify that uh, with a trick. I don't know if it's written down, but you also want to be able to choose the sign for all these family of functions together so that they are all positive, and that's somehow uh, not so easy, usually. Uh, okay, so then, yeah, if you manage to get convergence of interface for these other models, for the other kappa, then I think if I check one lemma, I can change this conjecture to a theorem, put your name on it. So, yeah, just a challenge for someone. I think you will need some new ideas because this identification part for the convergence is just, it seems these observables are, yeah, they don't satisfy enough relations so far. At least no one has found any good one. So that's why this is a theorem and the other one is a conjecture. Uh, okay, so I think it's time to tell you what these objects are, unless there are questions. 
just this terminology, pure partition versus partition function for boundary, could you repeat again what the word? Oh, uh, yeah. So the pure uh, is kind of a pure state of the internal connectivity. So it's giving you, it's labeled by how the connection goes. So if you do this SLE grow using this function, then almost surely the, the SLE curves will connect in this given way, in this alpha way. While if you grow the SLE using this one, it's a linear combination of these possibilities. So this is somehow the total uh, containing a convex um, set of all SLE measures related to this problem. And these are the corners of that convex set. So that's why they're pure. Yeah. Are these partition functions Z and F uh, positive functions? Uh, yeah, so in this case, uh, and you can observe it directly actually because the F has a nice formula. It will come soon, I think. And then Z is the linear combination with positive coefficients of this Fs. But it's, it's not clear for all kappa values. So do you know if there's a discrete version of the PDE at where you move the points? Uh, I haven't looked at it. I guess one might be able to cook up something like this. I think there's some work on this uh, when you try to prove uh, convergence of loop race walk in the natural parametrization. So Greg and Frederick had some uh, couple of papers and I think they had some difference equation. It's not exactly this one, but maybe somehow some related stuff, but I haven't looked. Uh, any more questions, comments? Can you just clarify again, so? Beta is just the collection of all the points on the boundary. Uh, so uh, beta and alpha, they are planar pairings. Uh -huh. And beta is describing outside. So I had this picture. Maybe I can go over there. This, this nice thing. So here, so beta was one of these uh, five uh, options, which are outside. Uh -huh. So telling how, how the outside is wired. Right, okay. So I'm fixing that. So that's my boundary condition. Mm -hmm. I think the standard one is usually this one is like alternating, but you could do these other ones as well. Okay, and so when you talked about it's an index. And this set is the set of planar pairings of these points. And then what's random is the inside thing. So I'm asking about probability of the inside thing being some given alpha for each alpha. Uh -huh. I see, but beta only affects how you assign weights. Yeah, so it's affecting these loops. Like yeah. Yeah, and in principle, you could try and do some rotation. So maybe some of these are redundant, but it's just nice to label them with the same set. Right, okay. And then M is just some combinatorial thing that doesn't depend on that. Yeah, it's so just then uh, you put this alpha and beta, these pictures on top of each other, then you count the loops. Okay. Uh, it's called the meander. So that's a combinatorial number. And it's just, if you put some alpha here, you have to see how many loops are formed from, with that alpha and these uh, things outside. And you have to include this in the weight of the your configuration. So somehow that's where, why this is coming from. But that's the tricky part to figure out that, uh, you know, this is kind of the weight of this probability of happening something inside. It's not only this Z alpha, like it's in some cases, it also has this kind of number in it. So that was the kind of non-trivial part, maybe related to some other, like the spin easing model case is simpler. Yeah. If I go, I think it was here. Yeah, so this is the combinatorial number. And then these are these uh, kind of pure corners of my set of functions. And uh, this is the combination of all of them. Of course, I could normalize them by some constant. So these are kind of a priori defined up to multiplication of constant, but I fix it somehow. And then these are kind of uniquely determined. Okay, 
So then, yeah, I think I already told you why the theorem is only about this case. Uh, at the bottom is maybe the interesting thing, because in this case, there's a special formula, which is just a spin easing correlation function, but you put, take the bulk points to the boundary in such a way that somehow every other point is even and every other point is odd. And then you label them somehow using this pairing. So never mind too much. These indices are related to this, this pairing beta. So it's explicit. And this is obviously positive. But for other kappa, uh, generally we don't have such a nice formula. So we have a bit different formula, which is not too bad, but it's less nice than this one. Uh, yeah, so here's a list of things one can prove. And let me show. Uh, Ah, so I wanted to mention the UST just briefly, I think. So that would be when the cluster weight is zero and this kappa parameter is eight. I think I will just flash it for the experts uh, because the statement is really similar. So if you don't know the model, never mind. It's just uh, uh, one in this family, but in a little bit degenerate case. So the same kind of uh, statement with some smoothness property of the boundary or uh, yeah, regularity property that's needed for the tightness. The same kind of uh, statement. So I omitted the combinatorial number by saying that it, for each possible configuration. So here is the combinatorial number will be zero or one, but just to simplify, because if you're looking at the model of a spanning tree, it has to have just one connected component. And that's why some alphas may be excluded. So that's the possible. Uh, anyway, never mind too much. It's the same family with this kappa value equaling eight. It has all these listed properties, uh, plus an additional interesting bit. Uh, if I get to flash you about the fusion rules, you see some logarithmic CFD phenomenon in this model, kind of immediately from these crossing uh, probabilities. For the other models, you have to go somehow dig deeper to see this. So this is the prominent case of some logarithmic phenomena that are interesting, at least from my point of view, because I'm partially kind of coming from CFT side. But as a probabilist, you can just say that, okay, here's a limiting statement and you can write down these, uh, these things. And this is conformally invariant, this ratio. Uh, okay. So now let me tell you about these functions a little bit, because they were rather mysterious, I believe. So Cardi, Made, wrote his formula, which is in general some hypergeometric function for this case of four points. So I have two times n points, always even number by planarity reason. Uh, more generally, so if you look at the hypergeometric function, it actually has an integral representation, and so do these uh, more general functions. So here's the f function. So basically, what you take, you take this so called Coulomb gas picture. So concretely, just some certain function, which has differences of these uh, variables to some powers. So it's supposed to be coming from some imaginary uh, wheel theory or something like this, but I don't know how to make that rigorous. So let's just take this formula. Then you, the trick is that you have some additional variables W that you integrate over. And the integration contours here, so this is a multiple integration, like capital N many. Uh, it's just determined by this pairing beta. So somehow uh, I didn't draw a picture, but uh, maybe I can draw here. So the simplest one is with four, four points. That's already known, but never mind. So you could take maybe beta was uh, uh, this one. So then you just integrate here uh, and there. So then this capital gamma of the notation was that is like gamma one, which is this, and gamma two, which is that other one. And you can go on with more generally. You have to make them non-intersecting and you have to mind convergence of the integral at these points. So if kappa is bigger than four, there's no problem. Otherwise you have to do some Pohammer type contours. But it's it's very kind of clear what to do for this case. Where is gamma in the formula? Uh, gamma is this capital gamma 
is a collection of n contours. So now I wrote capital gamma is a collection of two small gammas. Yeah, because there's a multiple integral. I should have maybe written several integral signs here. So the W j is over gamma j? Uh, yeah, so Ws live on the, they are integrated over, right? So these are, uh, the Ws are the screening variables in the Coulomb gas. So if you go to the physics book, this is kind of clear. The trouble is to find this, what you integrate all over, right? And you find this by requiring certain type of fusion rules, which determine this guy. I will try to show you a fusion rule very soon. But the point was that this is still very concrete. It was actually proposed by Julien Dupeda, to my knowledge, as the candidate for the uh, probability amplitude for the inside thing. But that was actually the Z and not this one. So then it took uh, quite a while for us to figure out what the inside guy was. And in this particular case I'm describing, uh, we had this relation that there was this meanders. We have the picture, uh, no picture, okay, sorry. Uh, these meanders of the alpha and beta, and you can write a linear combination of this form. So just to remind that meander was something like, uh, maybe if beta is that one, um, I flip it, and then alpha is something else, maybe this one. Then the meander alpha beta is the square root q, to the number of loops. So in this case, there's just one loop. So the statement, so I'm kind of making a claim here that this F is a combination of the Zs. So that's something one has to prove. But then now, if you could invert this matrix, you could find the Zs. But the trouble is that it's not always in invertible. And in particular, in our case, it's not invertible. So we have to specify them in a different way or with some limiting procedure. So what happens is that if this kappa parameter is not rational, this guy will be invertible, so you can do everything nicely. But its determinant has some zeros when kappa goes to some rational uh, points. Uh, it's called the meander matrix. Uh, and the phenomenon is that these Fs become linearly dependent. So you could think about the critical percolation where everyone is independent. So what does the boundary condition do? Nothing, right? Because the bonds don't feel it. So for critical percolation, all of these Fs are identically one. So they're certainly linearly independent. However, these Z guys are still linearly independent. So actually the statement for the critical percolation, you can just omit somehow this boundary condition. And then you're interested in these, uh, in these Fs. And I didn't describe here more precisely how to find them because I've given talks about it earlier. So you can solve these BBC equations with certain asymptotic boundary condition. So that's one way to uh, find them. So here I was hoping this relationship is concrete enough. So if you can invert, you can write Z as combination of these things. Then you can try and take a limit of kappa going to your favorite value. And uh, if you're careful, you can probably even do this. So I haven't bothered to look, you know, how the limit looks like, if everything works nicely. So there are some multiplicative factors here, which may blow up or go to zero. So one has to be a bit careful. But the upshot was that we understand these Fs very nicely and the Zs kind of, uh, we also understand they're maybe less nice. So it was a bit of a headache to find them. And now, do I still have a couple of minutes of rules, maybe? Uh, let's uh, skip this one. So this is clear for most of you, and if it's not, I think it's not helping. I just wanted to tell you a couple of things. Yeah. So how to, because you can plug in uh, this integral formula, and you could try and find, okay, so what do you integrate over, like this thing? So how do you select what you integrate over? So what is specifying your function? And it's uh, the behavior, what happens if you put the points together. So for instance, for here, I could take the limit x1, x2 go to zero, uh, sorry, go together. And somehow this contribution should vanish. And I should be just left with some n minus one point case. 
So if I describe all these possible asymptotics or fusion behaviors, I can specify the function. And this is, of course, coming from conformal field theory. So I just wanted to show a couple of formulas to make uh, kind of tell you how we find these functions, because I think otherwise it's very mysterious. Uh, OK, so if you look at these functions set, you can prove uh, the following behavior. So if you take two points together, which are next door, with a certain uh, blow up, <coughs> or I think this is going to zero, because this is blowing up, you just get a similar function with less points. So it's as if you just remove this connection. While if you take points together which were not connected, you're kind of fusing them, but this is not allowed with this normalization, so you'll get zero. And my claim is that if you plug in this and you solve the differential equation, uh, these guys are uniquely determined. And somehow with the pictures, it's very natural how, how these asymptotics go. And okay, this was just saying that uh, you can prove a similar thing for the crossing properties, but I will skip it maybe, because I want to show the happen with the Fs. So with the F, uh, if you do the same thing, this blob, if you think about uh, kind of what happens, is that you were supposed to count these uh, loops formed by the F. So if I remove this one, it should kind of be uh, contributing this loop factor. So that's what happens for, for the F, for the external guy. It's not completely obvious maybe, but that's, that's the difference between the Z and F. Uh, also, uh, I will draw it maybe. In this other channel, you will actually get something non-zero. So you will get, let's see. So if I draw maybe the, uh, yeah, something like that. So that's what I'm shrinking. And then they connect somewhere. So what I should do is to kind of connect them together and then pull this up. So what I get is a, a picture like, uh, yeah, that they still connect wherever they went, but they also form this kind of thing. And if you look at the model, it becomes also obvious why this is the case. Maybe in this one minute it's not, but uh, if you expose to it more, I think you will see uh, why this kind of thing should happen. So I'm claiming this is not work. And now let me show the CFT formulas just to finish. So if you're a CFT person, you say that this asymptotic is just a fusion of two phi one, two fields. And then you have two fusion channels. One is this identity channel or the zero leg. And the other one is the two leg or the one, three channel uh, with some exponents. So this was the one I was describing to you. There's a subleading exponent as well. And then there are some structure constants. Um, but actually, in the case of kappa equals eight, uh, you will see something else. So you will see a logarithm here. So if you do the asymptotics, uh, the previous slide was the case kappa not equal to eight. If you do the same, you will see a log correction. So I will not go there, but uh, I'm trying to say that you can discover the fusion rules from these partition functions. Of course, they are matching what the, our friends have been predicting, especially in Peter's uh, papers. So, um, yeah, I'm very happy to discuss more. I think I should stop. Thank you for listening. I have a question. So, in one of your slides, you mentioned that this function has the function to IC. Fk is a limit of the bulk. Uh, yeah. Can you say a bit more about that? It's a bit strange to me. Ah, oh, strange. Um, let's see. So where was the formula? Did I already miss it? Yeah. Uh, so it's kind of, if you think about the uh, Fk easing model, so you want to figure out what kind of operator would introduce this cluster boundary to grow from a point. And uh, you can, you know, with the coupling with the spin easing model, I guess you can try to convince yourself that it has to do with this, uh, this kind of easing spin. 
but then the points have to be on the boundary. So I don't, I'm actually wondering if the physicists here have a good explanation, because for me, this is not clear why it's exactly the spin correlation function. We can just, that one can prove it. So I think that this is something if you look at the coupling from the, like a, this idle circle coupling, then this will be clear from the discrete. This so the, that would be my belief, but it's not clear to me. But that's my understanding that for some people it's somehow expected. And I don't know if anyone here can uh, enlighten us. So somehow it should create some disorder, but for the cluster representation of the easy model. So, and uh, yeah. Yeah, so I have another question, which is, so in your main theorem, so basically if you divide this F, then what you get is that uh, um, I think uh, you have some like a relation between the crossing probability and this, uh, uh, this uh, meander matrix, right? And, it, and it, this meander matrix are coming from this uh, weight representation for this uh, random class of right? Yeah. And, uh, am I right that this equation, there, there is a discrete analog, like if you discrete, there are something also true here? I think there should be. Just by definition, right? Just yeah. by definition in the matrix. Yeah. So this should be some probability amplitude. I don't know if you can write so it down. Over all the possible weights of the Right, so the F, so F is a normalization factor, but that yeah. should be then yeah, this so easing spin correlation right. function. Just summing over all the, all the possible weights on bottom and all the possible weights yeah. on top. Yeah. There, there should be a identity of this kind. Yeah, I think. And then you just need to find this uh, discrete Z function. Because yeah. I think the combinatorics is exactly the same. And for some, like for double dimer models, for instance, uh, there is a a little bit different, so there's no meanders in that picture, but something else, and you, you see it also in the discrete level. Okay. So in this case, I actually haven't looked. Okay. Yeah, thanks. So have you done anything for these models on random lattices? Uh, I haven't. Uh, I don't know if uh, you know of any work that's, mm -hmm. uh, that would be towards this. Well, I don't know. I, I, mean, I just know that the FK easing you know, there's a kind of convergence that you get in these models yeah. that you don't get. Yeah, exactly. But on the other hand, you don't have a proof that the conformal structure, conformal structure converges. Right. But you do, you know, in terms of the boundary lengths. Yeah. You so have that sort of convergence. Yeah, and I think because this is just a formula, right? So this should be possible to maybe recover there on the random lattices if you have. So basically what you have need is the convergence of the interface. So maybe it's then on a random lattice and then you need some martingale argument, but this is already in the continuum. So the first bit is, you know, what's the discrete. So if you can do on a random lattice, uh, so what is there? At least the self avoiding walk uh, have been proven, right? Or FK. FK. Okay. FK so One thing I can mention is that uh, uh, one one question we can ask is that uh, we can consider this like a random disk with this like automatic boundary condition, mm -hmm. and then uh, what should be the case is that uh, this uh, this point, this the location of these points will be a random measure, and this random measure will be the density will be this, uh, this pure uh, this like a pattern function. It will be something like that, which for the cover smaller than four case. Uh, um, like Morris and Pru and I will try to uh, show this. So do you guys, can you guys recover this? We're trying, to, we're trying to recover this, but we're in, right. in the process, but they haven't. Uh -huh. Okay. For a couple of small four? For a couple of small. Yeah. Uh, it's, yeah. I mean, similar idea could work for color bigger. Uh -huh. I mean, yeah. But even for a couple of small four, we haven't uh, really finished that. I think uh, so. Morris will give a talk next Friday. Mm -hmm. The argument will be based on those ideas. Here. Yeah. More questions? Okay, let's think everything again.